You are listening to Lighthearted, the official podcast of the United States Lighthouse Society. My name is Jeremy Dontremont. Welcome. My co-host today is Michelle Jewell Shaw, teacher, mom, photographer, and chairperson of Friends of Portsmouth Harbor Lighthouses. Hi, Michelle. Hi, Jeremy, and hello to all of our listeners out there. This is episode 103 of Lighthearted, slated for February 8th, 2021. On this date in Lighthouse history, on February 8th, 1861, a period of heavy rain caused the Umpqua River in Oregon to rise about 45 feet. The flooding undermined the foundation of the Umpqua River Lighthouse. The light station was abandoned less than three years later, and it wasn't rebuilt on higher ground until 1888. On February 8, 1931, the American actor James Dean was born. He once said, quote, The greatness is in the doing, not in the results. End quote. And the composer and conductor John Williams was born on February 8, 1932. He's written the musical scores for many of the most popular movies ever made. He once said, quote, To continue to work, to continue to love what you do, is certainly a contributing element to one's longevity and health, unquote. Speaking of loving what you do, Michelle, I know you love photography and you're very good at it. Well, thank you, Jeremy. I do love taking photographs. I know you do, and it shows. <laughs> thank you. So our guest today is someone who has taken uh, some of the most beautiful photos of lighthouses uh, ever, I would say, including many night photos, one of his specialties. Lighthouses are just one of his favorite subjects. Michelle, please help me tell our listeners about photographer Pete Lero. Sure, Jeremy. Pete Lero is a graduate of Temple University in Pennsylvania, where he studied video, audio, and photography. In his career as a photographer, Pete has done work for the Department of Homeland Security, the NFL, the NBA, the NHL, and USA Gymnastics, among others. When he is not on assignment, he organizes photo workshops across the country. With Pete's unique workshops, guests can expect special access, private photo sessions, and a night of professional photography seminars. During some of the workshops, for example, railroads and museums are rented out for the evening, and there's always one-on-one -on -one interaction with Pete for the guests taking part in the workshop. Among Pete's events coming up this year are Lighthouse Photo Workshops on Long Island, New York, in Oregon, and in California. There's also a special one in the works to photograph the famous Twin Lights on Thatcher Island, Massachusetts. During these workshops, participants learn how to take great pictures at night by utilizing the light of the moon and the stars. Pete Lero has also done a series of Lighthouse Keeper photos utilizing a reproduction lighthouse service uniform and props like a handheld lantern and a spyglass. Participants in his lighthouse workshops get a chance to feel like they're stepping back in time by creating unique photos like these. That sounds cool. It is cool. It's very <laughs> cool. Along with lighthouses, Pete's extensive portfolio includes landscapes, railroads, cityscapes, historical reenactments, portraits, and more. You can see many of his photos and find out more about his workshops on his website at lerophotography.com. I had a chance to speak with Pete Lero recently. Joining in on the conversation was Jeff Gales, Executive Director of the U.S. Lighthouse Society. Let's listen to that conversation now. I'm speaking with Pete Lero, who I would say is one of the best lighthouse photographers in the United States. In fact, he would have to be one of the best photographers, period, in the United States. Uh, and Pete, you photograph a lot of other things well, besides uh, lighthouses. Pete is uh, his home just outside Philadelphia. I'm here in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. How are you doing, Pete? Doing pretty good yourself. Good, thanks. And also with us for this conversation is my good friend, Jeff Gales, the executive director of the United States Lighthouse Society, who's coming to us from Washington. The three of us are together today through the magic of Zoom. How's it going, Jeff? Good, Jeremy. Hi, Pete. How you doing? Let's start with some of the basics. Pete, how did you first get interested in photography? Well, I was on a eighth grade class trip to New York City. We went to the top of the World Trade Center and uh, had a throwaway camera, one of those disposable Kodak cameras, and uh, took some pictures. And I got the pictures back. I was pretty disappointed in the quality of them. I wanted to learn how to take better pictures. My dad showed me how to use his old Minolta SLR camera that he had since the early 80s. I just started learning on my own. It was 
shooting film all throughout high school and went digital once I got to college. By the way, I started with the brownie, little brownie camera in the sixties with the flash bulbs. You took, you use the flash bulb, you know, per picture, Mm -hmm. pop the flash bulb out and put another one in. Do you remember those, Jeff? Oh yeah. My first camera was a little bit after that, but it was uh, my first official camera was a uh, Kodak one step Polaroid camera, which I sure wish I still had because they're worth a fortune now, but yeah, you guys, are you probably too young to remember that, Pete? One step. Yeah, a little bit before my time. <laughs> He's just a kid. But we had a Swinger Polaroid uh, camera in mine. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Remember the Swinger? Those were pretty Yeah, popular. when the Polaroids anyway. were invented, it was like this miracle of modern science. I mean, I mean, it was probably just as incredible as when Kodak came out with the original brownies and people were able to walk around and take pictures on their own. Oh, yeah. So, Pete, as I mentioned before, you lighthouses are one of your favorite things to photograph, but you... Mm-hmm photograph a wide array of subjects. You do commercial photography uh-huh. along with landscape and lighthouse work and lots of other stuff. Uh-huh. So is there a particular kind of photography you enjoy most? Well, I enjoy photographing almost everything. I think lighthouses were the first thing I actually started photographing. That was because I went on a camping trip right after I started taking pictures down in the Outer Banks. So Body Island and Hatteras. So I really love the history of them, being a history buff. Just wanted to learn more about them and really enjoyed the history. So I just wanted to see them all, essentially. I've always loved trains my whole life, especially steam trains. My dad always took pictures of them as we grew up. And as I got into photography, I started taking pictures of them. I think the overall theme is just I love history and photographing certain things, trying to photograph them as if they were what they were back in the day versus, you know, what they look like modern wise. Like with the World War II photo shoots, we enjoy like doing a try to get guys in full authentic uniforms and uh, get the scenery right, the airplanes, tanks, the whole nine yards, stamp the trains, get the old buildings, people dressed up. Uh, even with lighthouses, uh, we'll um, try to hide anything modern, vehicle stuff like that, and then people dressed up in lighthouse keeper uniforms and just try to recreate history and photograph it, kind of like a, a movie, just without all the money and the budget that you need to do. <laughs> well, well, I want to talk more about that kind of stuff. You do an amazing job. They really do. It's like I was just thinking about, I was looking at your uh, your gallery on your website just a little while ago, and I was thinking, it's like you're using the camera as a time machine in a way. Uh, yeah, sort of I, like, I've yeah. always really enjoyed that 1930s, 1940s era. Uh, the music, just the uh, upbeat part of life until obviously the war hit, but uh, just a real patriotism. There's just a lot of history in that time. And uh, so we really like to photograph that era with the trains and World War II, the civilian photo shoots and all. It's just kind of like, as close as you can get to being there, kind of immerse yourself into the photo shoot a bit. Because I'll even get dressed up for the World War II events and immerse myself with the reenactors. So I kind of blend in so they don't notice me and I can photograph them naturally. I think that aspect of uh, time travel and Pete's photographs makes his, uh, his work really unique. I, I don't I mean, I don't have experience around the world, but I would venture to say there's very few people who go to the trouble that he does to set up these shots and uh, bring people that picture of history. I mean, it's a really unique thing. And you do it so well. That's, I think, what sets you. It might be other people who try it, but nobody does it, you know, as well as you do, I think. Thank you. So let's talk a little bit more about your workshops. Uh, mm-hmm. That's a big part of, I know you do a lot of other work as well, but you uh, offer a number of workshops through the year, through the year, although this year is probably a little bit different. Yeah, this year's certainly been a challenge uh, doing anything of any big scale. It gets started off doing the railroad fo- uh, photo workshops. We would get a bunch of guys together, rent the train out and photograph it, which you couldn't do during the day on a regular passenger train. But a number of those guys knew I was photographing lighthouses and They'd ask if they could tag along with me for a couple of trips, and we did so. And then uh, we wanted to do some more things where we'd stay in places at nighttime. So started getting a couple of permits for us to do, you know, do it commercially. And then we started chartering boats, and then it just expanded from there to where it is today. That we'll run at least three or four uh, photography workshops, and I'll teach them how to take pictures daytime, nighttime. We'll get special access to certain lighthouses, charter boats to go to lighthouses you can't get to normally. I guess the big difference from our boats to like one of the society's normal boats is we'll go out at four in the morning and travel 90 minutes and be at a lighthouse for sunrise, um, or we'll be out at sunset and land on an island at nighttime. Uh, just stuff you, you normally don't do with the general public if you have 50 or 60 people on a boat. Uh, we'll, you have anywhere between four to 10 people, something a lot more manageable where we can do more up close and personal or landings and so forth. It's, it's a, a harder core audience. 
uh, mm -hmm. who want to take pictures 30 miles offshore at five in the morning. <laughs> so sure. Yeah. But we're there, we're there to work. We're there to get good pictures and that's what they sign up for. Pete's tours uh, are very similar to the way that the society's tours evolved, lighthouse tours. It started off with just going to see a few lighthouses and then groups of people started getting interested in seeing more. And then we started, you know, chartering small buses to go visit certain states' lighthouses. And then it just expanded from there to multi-night trips because people figured, well, I'm in the area. I want to see more stuff. And uh, of course, history and education were always the the important part of it, uh, but definitely Pete's clientele, people who participate in his tours are really interested in the photography aspect and capturing that perfect image. I would have to say that society tours are photographic tours as well. And I think there are a lot of people in the society who go on our trips who would like to learn more about you know the details of photography and how to get a better picture. They kind of dovetail in a way. The it was Lighthouse Society's regular tours and uh, Pete's tours. Pete's we we've talked trip. about combining forces on more things. Obviously, this year just didn't work out to really for anybody in any kind of tourism business. Um, but we, we've talked about combining forces on some stuff for next year and, and later in the future. So we look forward to seeing what we can come up with. Sounds good. So let me ask you if uh, people listening are interested at some point taking part in a workshop with you. Do you have requirements? Is there a certain level of photographer, you know, of photography knowledge required, or are they open to photographers at all levels? Um, I'm open to beginners through professionals. Um, I only ask that they know how to work the basics of their camera, shutter speed, aperture, ISO, know, just know how to work the camera, the basics, because especially if we're working at nighttime, I'm teaching nighttime photography, um, if you don't understand the basics of what a shutter speed does or what ISO means, then you're going to be way behind the rest of the group. As long as you know the basics of what you're doing, you're more than welcome to join us and we'll help you out. And, uh, and through, with each, each of the workshops, there are some people who know a lot more than others, and I'll, I'll focus more on the people who need some of the more help. But it becomes a uh, like a community. Um, we all become friends towards the end of the trip, and everyone's willing to help each other out. And I stay in touch with almost everyone who does these trips. And a lot of them come back for more because they really enjoy the experience. Some, again, some are very beginners. Some of them are actually uh, co-workers of mine and we shoot professional sports. Um, so there's all different levels of people and we're all willing to help each other out. And as I said, as long as you know just the bare minimum basics of how the camera operates and some of the terms, you're able to participate and we'll help get you some really good pictures. We talked earlier about the uh, recreations that you include in the workshops, uh, which are pretty unique. Uh, World War II, Civil War, and I noticed Navajo uh, Nation oh. theme shoots. Uh, yeah. So it's pretty, pretty wide range. I guess a couple of questions. Uh, how far back does this go? And I'm sure it's developed a lot over the years. And it's probably going to continue. Do you have uh, any new? Well, I'm asking you too many questions at once here. Okay. okay. Also wondering if you have any new ideas that you might try in the future. Well, we I started my train tours in 2005. Did a lot of stuff with antique vehicles and people dressed up in ear, ear clothing. And um, I was already photographing lighthouses since the uh, late 90s, but I never put any of the uh, human uh, element into it. But when I started having people come out with the lighthouse shoots, it occurred to me like, well, why don't we put a person in this picture and kind of recreate history like we do with the with the railroad shoots. So I, um, I invested some money and bought a lighthouse uh, keeper uni uh, uniform for myself uh, with the intention of someone else wearing it. And we started putting that into the photo shoots and it was a really good hit when we did it. So we just continued to do it. And this year we uh, started to include a lighthouse keeper's wife as one of the reenactors of the photo shoots. That. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was, you know, it, it added more of a family element into our photography. And, um, and we're just going to keep on expanding it from there. You would ask about what other themes we have done. I mentioned a couple of them. What what did I leave out? You've done World War II, Civil War, Native American theme. We've done uh, like a cowboy, outlaw, Western theme as well. Um, that kind of mixes in with the Navajo Western theme. We've done uh, Rosie the Riveter. Uh, we've mm -hmm. done a lot of 1930s, 1940s civilian life. Uh, we're looking at doing some 1950s photo shoots at a diner next year. We've talked about trying to do something like space NASA-ish. Uh, we got a lot of guys that are really interested in that. Oh, that's, wow. Yeah. That's a whole other level of uh, 
pricey uniform to try <laughs> I to was thinking that sounds pretty uh complicated so, and expensive. Someone found out that you can get a 1960s era space uniform for thirteen thousand dollars. So there's people out there that make these things, but I think you that's probably, a little bit you could probably rent one for around five thousand. Yeah, probably. Uh, we'd be better off probably just trying to contact NASA or a museum about what would it cost us to borrow it for a day right. or have one of their interpreters just wear it for us. And we just pay the museum to let us come in for the day. Mm-hmm. You'd have um, to rent space at Cape Canaveral or something. We, how would you recreate the uh, the uh, the moonscape? Well, they did it in the 60s. <laughs> so, <laughs> now, um, we would want to do something more in like the cockpit or the module. Um, where the guys would be sitting in there with lights turned on, that sort of thing. We actually have a couple friends that have contacts at NASA, so it could be something down the road. But with any of the historic photo shoots I do, we never just jump in and do a photo shoot without knowing any of the history. Um, I really like to learn about some of the history that what goes on that way. I know that we're putting as much accuracy into it as possible. Um, I wouldn't want to have the photographers come in and then one of them, who really knows a lot more than I do, picks out everything wrong and then it, doesn't go very well so I want to make sure um I have a really good understanding of the history so when we started doing like the Cowboys Westerns or uh Civil War World War II I I wanted to do a lot of homework and uh, a lot of research even with World War II each of the services the Navy the Air Force the Army there's a lot of differences between the services and uniforms right down to the props the Air Force and the Navy use different cameras for their photographers at the time so whenever we have a person taking pictures in our pictures we have to know what camera they're using. We have to know what uniform they're using. Every year of the war is very different as well. So you have to know a lot of the history if you want to make it right. And uh, picking the right reenactors for the job is really important too, because they know a lot of history and have a lot of uniforms and can bring a lot of knowledge into it. So it's it's definitely not like say, hey, let's just do this and jump jump right in. There's there's a lot of time. I'd say it takes at least a year or two to really develop you know a new uh, new theme. To get the right people, the right research, make sure we have enough props and, and the knowledge and really focus in on one specific part of that um, shoot. Like if we're going to do a World War II plane, we got to know which plane, what year, what area. You have to really focus in, in because you can't just say, oh, this should shoot World War II. And then you have a mixed match of everything that would not make sense historically. You could say the same for like a lighthouse keeper. You wouldn't want to have a guy in a 1960s outfit with 1920s technology in with a Fresnel lens that doesn't, you know what I mean? You want to make sure you really try to bring all the aspects of history together correctly instead of just jumping in. So there's lots of themes we do, and it's taken a long time to uh, to work on each one because we don't want to just throw them together and just hope for the best. Well, the preparation shows, the as far as the Lighthouse Keeper, Keepers of the Light, right? That's the series you call it? The, the, uh... the, yeah, the, 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 the photography series, yes. Yeah, yeah. The detail looks, I certainly can't find any fault with it. And Thank some you. of them look just like pictures from that era. But of course, a lot of them are color photos taken right. with modern techniques, but still right. the, uh, the subjects look uh, you know, completely accurate. One of the things that we had to do, um, we have the lantern, as you see in some of the pictures, especially with the National Park System or some of these mu- museums, they don't want anything open flame for obvious reasons. They don't want us to burn their place down. Um, so I had to do a little research, try to find a couple of lanterns that would have been almost, you know, 100% accurate to what they would have had back then. And then we convert them to LED lighting. Um, that way we can now go inside certain buildings and aspects, but just doing the research is trying to find lanterns that match what the service had versus just going to Walmart and buying something or, you know, anything that would not be accurate. We want to make sure it's as accurate as possible, but also play it safe and convert them to LED Obviously, the, the regular, a real lantern looks a little better, but we have to work within the confines of what we can do and keep the, the parks and museums happy. World War II images that he takes, that Pete takes, are so realistic, even though, even though they're color, because nowadays you can see programs on TV where they show the color film that they were photographing things or filming things with in you know, the 1940s. And when you look at that, it looks like it was taken yesterday. I and mean, people are wearing different clothes and they seem to look a little different, but it really brings home, uh, it really modernizes World War II. And I think his photographs tend to look like that. They're, they are historical in nature, but they really, they really bring it home in a severe way, significant way. They bring it home in a significant way. Your website is, is it 
Larophotography.com, is that correct? Larophotography.com. People should check that out. And there's various galleries, including the Lighthouse Gallery, which I, I think you just, you told me you just uh, updated it, added some more stuff. Yeah. And within the Lighthouse Gallery is the Keepers of the Light, uh, Keepers of the Light photos, which mm -hmm. people absolutely need to check out. You know, all your other stuff, uh, certainly worth looking at too. Mm -hmm. Maybe this is kind of an obvious question, but I'm interested in your feelings about it. What makes lighthouses so popular for photography? Well, there's a lot of history to them, and they tend to be in a lot of really beautiful locations. Um, there's a little bit of an, uh, an aura to them, a little mystique to them, and people want to be able to, to capture a little bit of all that. You know, as you know, some lighthouses are more scenic and beautiful than others. But one thing when I really got into it, after about my second year, I realized, you know, lighthouses are really meant to be working at nighttime, so I should try photographing them at nighttime. And when I mentioned that to people, like, yeah, I guess that kind of makes sense. And when you look at a lighthouse at nighttime, totally different than the daytime, because with the beams of light, if there's any fog, there's a lot, more, to me, there's a lot more atmosphere and a lot more mystique to them at nighttime, because when you think of a lighthouse, you think of that sweeping beam of light, a foghorn, you know, the real romance to what a lighthouse is. And you, you don't necessarily get that during the day. Or your night, night photography is amazing. And, uh, it's gotten definitely more popular in recent years, night and lighthouse photography, mm -hmm. but nobody's doing it better, better than you. That's for sure. Well, I yeah. appreciate it. Yeah. Modern cameras have really helped make night photography a lot easier. When I started doing it, I was shooting film still. and I'd use this big giant 12 volt flash, uh, flashlight trying to light up a lighthouse and uh, couldn't really get any of the Milky Way or a lot of the stars just because film and ISO wasn't as sensitive as you needed it to be. But in the last five, seven years, digital cameras there, you can crank the ISO up so high you can capture Milky Way or any stars very easily. You still have to know what you're doing. You have to know certain settings and you got to plan ahead too. You got to look what the moon's doing. I see what the weather's doing. And uh, certain lighthouses are, are better to photograph at nighttime than others. And uh, certain conditions can warrant whether you're going to get a good picture or not. Many people can just buy their uh, fancy SLR digital camera and set it to automatic, and they think they can get a good shot, but it's not always like that, is it? Mm -mm. Automatic you, doesn't really work at nighttime. You have to you have to go manual and you have to tell the I, camera what to do. On your website, you have a lot of uh, lighthouse photos with Fresnel lenses. Obviously, Fresnel lens is a historical lens, and you're probably drawn to those. But what what would be the difference in photographing a lighthouse with a modern light as opposed to a Fresnel lens? In recent years, last couple of years, they've really been switching to LED lights. I guess one of the biggest difference you're going to realize is the color. Incandescent bulbs uh, have a nice warm yellow color to them. The newer LED lights have this really cold white purplish light to them. And they just blink on, they blink off. They blink on, they blink off. The older incandescent bulbs, they either they blink on a lot longer or they would stay on and the whole light and mechanism would spin especially the Fresnel lenses, um, they would put out this huge beam of light that photographically looks far superior to just a little blinking LED bulb. LED bulbs have a very tight uh, focal plane on them. So they're, unless you're looking directly at the height of it, it doesn't look like anything. Um, I equate it to being like a, a little blinker on someone's bicycle, unless you're way off in a distance. I've photographed a number of lighthouses that had a incandescent bulb or even a Fresnel lens in it now it has an LED bulb and it's just, it's sad. I mean, I, I understand it, it uses pennies to the dollar cost wise of electricity, but photographically you just lose the whole richness of the scene, the whole beauty of it all. They have these big giant sweeping beams of light over the horizon to just a little, little blink. I think people who live by lighthouses, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a stark contrast from what the light used to be to what it's become. It's the same thing with fog signals. When a Fox and Mill gets decommissioned, all of a sudden local community, the local community goes crazy. So what happened to our to our Fox and Mill? Because they didn't find it to be annoying or obtrusive. They like, liked it. And yeah. when a lighthouse uh, gets downgraded from a sweeping light mm -hmm. that uh, shines for miles to a little LED bulb, there's a lot of a uh, lot of surprise and disappointment. So yeah. too bad they can't make LED bulbs that have that same effect as a Fresnel lens. They just installed a rotating LED. Well, they're putting one down in Oak Island, down in North Carolina. That is the one I was thinking of. That, yeah. was, that had the big giant uh, arrow beacons, and it had four of them. But they were really powerful. You could still get the four beams going out there. I'm 
I'm going to be disappointed probably when I see it with this LED yeah. light in it. I can't imagine that it would look any different than just the flashing LED. Well, I, I've heard that the, they're going to probably do it to Hatteras soon too. Mm. Take the arrow beacons out, put the LEDs. I mean, I get it. it. That thing's broken down several times in the last few years. I think the DCB arrow beacons are even brighter than the Fresnel lenses. I mean, those things are really powerful. The arrow beacons in general spin faster than a, a slow moving uh, Fresnel lens just because they had the old clockwork that had to really keep them slow. So photographically, you'd have a nice big wider beam uh, with a Fresnel lens versus an arrow beacon where it's spinning around. You got to use a couple of techniques of blocking the lens and opening the lens to kind of enhance it a little bit just because it's going so fast. I think. Uh, I haven't seen it yet, but they've put a, a LED bulb inside Pemaquid. I believe that they saw the Fresnel lens, but they just changed the bulb out. Yeah, I'll see that next month. Unfortunately, uh, I think the color is going to be that whitish purple still. I haven't, I don't think there's a bulb that's reliable enough for them to use the yellow incandescent color yet. I think it's just right. the manufacturer not making it. But it's, it's a shame because I've the places like uh, Marshall Point, a couple of lighthouses on the Great Lakes. Um, I used to photograph with the, uh, nice warm incandescent bulbs. Now they have this whitish purple and it just doesn't mix well when you're shooting night skies. It, it becomes this really white purple. It's just not very, it's not the nicest, not aesthetically pleasing, I guess you could say. it. So. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's what's really interesting about taking one of Pete's trips is that you know, anytime, anytime we do a Lighthouse Society tour, we talk about light signatures and the, the light, pat, light pattern, this fog signal signature. And when you do one of those trips, you really get immersed in that light pattern that you know, you know, four flashes on, two flash, two two seconds off, or whatever it is, you become really connected to that when you're trying to photograph these at night, right, Pete? Oh yeah, you, you definitely got to learn the signal, especially if you're trying to time it where you want to create the beam a little brighter or darker, or uh, trying to capture it so you can get more Milky Way in there. You got to cover the lens up. It, it, you only need one flash in your picture, and then you have to cover all the other flashes up so you don't overblow your picture. You definitely have to learn the signals. An atmosphere really plays a part into that as well. If it's really foggy out, then you know, that could change your whole angle up or you may need more flashes or less flashes. So there's mm -hmm. definitely got to learn the signals. And, and while we're standing out there, let's say when we're at um, Seguin Island, I was pointing out and I knew that the, the flash patterns to three or four of the lighthouses, you can point out and you can look out and know that oh, eight, you know, one flash every eight seconds is that lighthouse or two flashes every eight seconds that way is another lighthouse. You can just kind of teach people that and then they can realize, oh, that's what the what the shift or the mariners have to look for when they're looking at all these random lights out there. Which one's flashing at what pattern? It, it makes an appreciation for them to know what you know people on the boats are looking for and what they're going through. I mean, that's the whole point of learning about lighthouses, and then it leads to a whole bunch of other subjects about how lighthouses work for navigation. So mm -hmm. it's a really good first step into learning about you know how to use lighthouses for sure. But I wanted to go back to uh, your photograph. Uh, of Umqua in Oregon, because that's such an amazing shot with the red and white beams coming out. Mm -hmm. Was that more of a challenge than other lighthouses you photographed? Just setting that up in general was a little bit of a challenge because that is a, um, a Coast Guard uh, family station. There's a number of houses there that have families that live there at the Coast Guard. So we had to work with the museum, the museum worked with the Coast Guard. Uh, we had a number of lights turned off. You can see there's a lot of darkness down on the hill. There were a lot of houses that had lights on. They all agreed to have their lights turned off. I would send them some pictures. And then um, to really get those beams to show up, we needed fog. And about 20 minutes before this picture, there, was, there wasn't there was any fog. It just looked like a light was on in the lighthouse. You didn't really see any beams coming out. But out of nowhere, it was like a wall. It all just came in. And those those beams just enhanced just having a time your exposure just to get just the right thickness of beam. I, th I think it was about, I'd probably say about one to one and a half seconds of an exposure mm -hmm. just to get the perfect thickness on the beams. I'd say within 15 minutes of these pictures, the fog just kind of went away. We, we got our shots. You, know, you just got a lot of it's just right place, right time. Uh, we came back to this lighthouse two years later and we had hardly any atmosphere and it just didn't look like anything. And everyone was, there were some people that did it before there, or, you know, they understood a couple other people were like, Oh, that's a shame. I was really looking for some, some really thick beams, but you know, it's just, you gotta be the right place, right time. And, and actually the coast guard was looking at taking that lens out of commission a couple of years ago. And I think the, the, the whole community, you know, blew up over it. So that lighthouse is going to keep its Fresnel lens. So, um, you know, thank Good. goodness. I would, I would definitely advocate to keep that one in there. That's one of the most special ones we've got in the country. Oh, I agree. It's my favorite lens I've ever seen. Yeah, they were going to do one down in um, California, Point 
Cabrillo. Yeah. That's the yeah. one that's like a little house with the, the tower built into it, right? It has the, the three paneled spinning. For, yeah, they, they were going to take that one out too. And again, the community came together and they rallied and the Coast Guard agreed to keep it in there. They just, you won't get pictures like that at all with the LED, even if it's spinning, it's just, you won't get them. When Pete uh, came down with his group to uh, Washington, where our headquarters is at point no point, he got it set up with the Coast Guard uh, to allow us to turn on the little fourth order for now lens, a little tiny little thing, uh, you know, to get that effect of the sweeping beam or what have you, the rotating lens. And I'll never forget when I went out there after they got it all lit up and it was nighttime, how, what an amazing difference it was. I mean, it, it, it felt like a lighthouse. It was sweeping not only over the water, but over the hillside and, and just lit up everything so brightly. It was absolutely a little fourth order lens. It was incredible. Yeah. And then they switched back, of course, to the, to the LED light, the exterior light. And I mean, gosh, how disappointing. <laughs> yeah. We could talk about lenses all, all day, I'm sure. Uh, it's a great subject. But uh, Pete, let's uh, get back to uh, night photography. Mm -hmm. uh, we've talked about some lighthouses you photographed at night, but uh, any others that really stand out for you, some of your favorites? The large lenses really, really stand out to me. Um, there's a lot on the West Coast, uh, Cape Blanco, Hesita Head, out on the East Coast. There's a couple up in Maine, Seguin, uh, Seguin. Seguin Island. There's a couple in Florida, Hillsboro. Just last month, uh, I got to photograph the Split Rock Lighthouse for the, uh, the Edmund Fitzgerald sinking. I arranged with them to do a uh, little extra lighting once the general public left. I made a donation to the museum and the snowstorm had just kicked in. And then when they turned it on, it was just like mega beams going out to sea. It was, it made for some really good pictures. Um, I think generally the, the larger lenses, um, especially the, uh, the beam high lenses, I just really love them. They just put out awesome beams. It just makes for really great pictures. Yeah. Um, never yeah so the like the, the conditions you want, this, if you want to capture the Milky Way, for instance, you want a completely clear sky. But if you want yeah. to capture the workings of a lens or the light emanating, you want a little weather. Is that right? Yeah, you can't have, well, yeah, there's not a really, really good way to get both. So there are certain lighthouses will plan certain trips for certain effects. If we want to photograph a, a first or second order lens, I'll generally schedule a trip where the moon's probably about 30 to 50% full. Um, that way we can illuminate the sky as well as get some of the, uh, the landscape lip because uh, those lenses are so bright, you really can't capture too much on the ground or really too much of the stars. Just, especially if there's a little bit of moisture in the air, it just illuminates everything. Whereas if they light, if you have a first order or second order that blinks, um, you can time it where you can capture one or two flashes and then allow the Milky Way to burn in the rest of the image. So you have to really know what a lighthouse does, what the signal's doing to kind of plan a trip for what kind of effect you want. I um, didn't realize that you were looking at the astronomy as well. I mean, what the moon's doing, that's fascinating. Sure. Oh yeah, you, you try to photograph a, a spinning lens like Cape Blanco or um, Casita Head, you try doing that when there's no moon out, it's just so bright. You don't really get any of the landscape illuminated because there's you just can't allow it to burn in without blowing out the whole image of the lighthouse. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll generally try to plan those trips where um, the moon is up for a little bit, or at least partially. If you have a full moon, it almost looks like a daytime picture. It's so bright. People don't realize how bright a full moon really is until you really stop and look around. You don't really capture that many stars when it's up there. So I, I generally will try, if we're going to go for, for moon pictures, we'll, um, we'll probably go for like 30 to 50% moon. There are some factors that will will have to go when it's about full moon, but we'll work to our advantage when the moon's either setting or rising, depending what time of the day. You can get like that really nice orange moon at sunset or sunrise. So we'll work our advantage. We'll try to find a lighthouse where we can do a zoom shot where the lighthouse is here and the moon is real nice and colorful on the horizon. I've always wondered, uh, you know, the light coming from a lighthouse at night is so bright. How are you able to capture uh, details on the exterior of the building? So um, I, I'll use an LED light to kind of illuminate the side of the lighthouse, or we just try to plan it where the moon's going to be in the right position. That's why sometimes we're out one, two, three in the morning, waiting for the moon to get up in a position where we want it. The little LED lights work really good to our advantage. I used to use a flash because I didn't have an LED at the time, but now LEDs are getting a lot brighter, more powerful. And uh, so I'll, I'll put it out there and we'll just set it up and let the photographers be able to do their shooting. So you're actually, uh, you're almost like creating a lighted set for your photos. For Absolutely. 
there's been a couple of lighthouses, um, including uh, Sejwal Point up in Michigan, where we'll work with the museum and make a nice donation to them. And they'll turn off all of their exterior lights, could be garage lights, security lights, just ambient light that's, you know, different places to kind of, for security reasons, or just make it look nice at nighttime. Um, we'll get all that turned off. And then we'll put up our own LED lighting and just put it in one spot to make it look like it's naturally lit. And we'll be able to capture our nighttime pictures that way. Because sometimes if you have garden lights or garage lights, it just blows everything out and you can't get a nice clean picture out of it. So there's definitely a lot of planning and a lot of cooperation with uh, the museums and the societies to make these pictures happen. It's not often we just walk up and it works perfectly. There's There has to be some planning and working with people. Obviously, there's a lot of planning, but I'm wondering if, uh, you know, obviously you can plan to a certain extent and there's going to be things that happen that you didn't expect. That's always the case. Mm -hmm. Are there any especially memorable, unexpected incidents, either during your workshops or or on your own that you can think of? So we were doing a photography workshop um, at the Seguin Island Lighthouse in Maine. And uh, we, we planned it out. We chartered a special boat ride. I had it all planned out. We were going to, we rented out the keeper's house. We we're going to spend the night. It was either going to be I wearing the uniform or the, uh, I guess the caretaker that stays there. I guess they, they have people that stay there every couple of weeks. The gentleman, I was going to ask him if he could wear it. Well, it didn't fit him just properly. So I was like, all right, I'll, I'll wear the uniform. Well, we we're shooting sunset pictures. And along comes this uh, man and woman and they're just sitting on this bench. And we're like, that guy looks like, you know, Captain <laughs> Smith of the Titanic. We should have him pose in the pictures. So we're all looking at each other like he was going to ask him. So I'm like, all right, I'll do it. So I go up to him and I'm figuring he's going to just say no. Like you guys are weird, you know. Well, I asked him, he's like, oh yeah, I'll do it. Let me just finish watching Sunset with my wife here. I'm like, okay, great. So about 30 minutes later, he walks over. I hand him the uniform. He goes inside and gets dressed and it fit him perfectly. Him and his wife sold their house and they bought the sailboat and they were just sailing around the world. And they just happened to be at the island with us. He looks like the perfect lighthouse keeper. It's absolutely perfect. It's amazing. He, Just uh, so people know what picture we're talking about when they hear this, if you go to lerophotography.com, go to the Keepers of the Light Gallery. It's the third one black and white photo of the guy with the white beard he, on the porch at Seguin Island. He's the first picture as well. That's a great picture too. They're both. You. you can see some of the other stuff we've done with lighthouse keepers, uh, like walking up the steps at Caratuck Beach. Or um, you can see Chad Kaiser at the desk with the typewriter. I noticed that, yeah. He's a mutual friend of all three of us, I think. People need to look at your website and look through these galleries, the uh, just galleries by state and the the night uh, photography and the keepers of the light. They're all all amazing. There is a pretty significant difference between, you know, Lighthouse Society tours where you know, every detail is taken care of and, you know, we, we arrange for lodging and for uh, uh, meals and for, you know, obviously lighthouse access and we're somewhat helpful with photography and things of that nature. But um, your tours are more of adventure tours. Do you want to talk a little bit more about what people should expect if they sign up as far as, uh, you know, how the tours operate? Well, my, my photography tours are photography driven. We're, we're there to focus on the photography and I, you know, I'll push, you know, people not too hard, but I'm going to push people to, you know, work hard to get their, you know, photography levels a little higher and to push through to want to shoot longer through the night. Cause that's to me, lighthouses were meant to work at night. So that's what we're going to shoot through. And it, it, it's not for everyone. That's for sure. But you have to be serious. You, you know, you want to have that passion to want to get those pictures. Yeah. I remember when you came out to point, no point. Um, I walked out there to see everybody. It was a chilly night and it felt like it was a camping party. You know, there are a lot of people dressed up with backpacks and, mm-hmm. and their, their camping jackets and things on and big boots. I mean, is that typically what people are doing? Yeah, we're, we're, we have to be pretty much self-sufficient because if we're shooting sunset, nighttime and sunrise, it doesn't leave much time for dinner or breakfast. Uh, a lot of us will actually rest during the day. So you want to make sure you have, you know, you want to be dressing. You want to have plenty of clothing, plenty of extra food. You know, again, we're there to, to, to shoot pictures. If you want to go get something to eat, and, you know, you're on your own on that one. Everyone drives themselves and people are welcome to leave when they want to. But we're, we're there to, to work and, and get really good pictures. And sometimes you have to just forego a meal or, uh, you know, just push yourself to stay awake longer than you normally do. This is more photography driven as opposed to a family outing. I definitely don't recommend kids coming. Is there an age limit? 
I, I've had someone who was 15 or 16 come along with their father. And I, I, I made sure I, you know, told the father, hey, look, this is what's going to go on. I just want to make sure, you know, you're, you're, he actually brought his daughter. And, and she was able to keep up with us. And she was very happy. And she was enjoyable to have. But with everyone who signs up, um, especially with someone who may be a little more elderly, I'll, I'll just let them know, like, hey, this is going to be, you know, we're going to be walking around on rocks at nighttime. We're going to be out shooting for several hours. If it's raining, we're still going to be out there shooting. This isn't a little walk in the park. This is, we're there to take good pictures. And uh, sometimes you have to work for it. You know, and, and the results, you know, show it. Everyone comes away with really good pictures and an understanding of, you know, sometimes you got to work a little harder to, to get those pictures, but we're there to get the, the money shot and you have to work for it sometimes. The way I cued it to when I'm explaining it to people, it's like, if you go to Africa for a wildlife safari, this would be like that. You're getting up at all hours of the night, all hours of the day. We're out there to have a safari of lighthouses and we're there to just do that. We're not there to, you know, go into town and go shopping. This is, we're there to, get the pictures that we really want. Uh, in some of your photos, you use black and white. Some of the keeper photos and some of the lighthouse photos, you've used black and white. And I know you've done it a lot with the, the period photos, trains and things like that. You also had some pictures of Yosemite on your site that mm -hmm. look just like Ansel Adams photos, the classic uh, black and white Ansel mm -hmm. Adams photos. I'm just wondering uh, in general, when how do you decide when to use black and white? Well, uh, Ansel Adams is one of my first inspirations of photography, by the way. So I really liked, uh, I read a couple of his books and really got an understanding for dynamic range and when black and white works best. And uh, yet when looking at a scene, you have to look at it not in color, but in brightness and in tone. Looking at certain pictures, I, I like to use black and white if there's a big change in brightness versus color contrast. If certain pictures or angles of a particular person look like they're more old time-ish, I'll try it in black and white or a sepia tone. Um, but it really comes down to a, a contrast and lighting and tone versus color contrast. Nice dark skies with a bright object really help stand out. Or like I said, certain poses with people, if they look like that could be like transposed back in time, I'll, I'll try it with a, a black and white filter. Would you say there's anything in particular you're trying to convey in your lighthouse photos? What do you want the, the viewers to, to come away with when they look at your lighthouse photos? Good question. I would say just an appreciation for the beauty that's there and not to change it, like build up modern buildings around it or take a Fresnel lens out or destroy what's there. I guess just try to enjoy the beauty that's there and make you want to go visit it yourself and enjoy what I saw. What I take away from Pete's work is a sense of place, uh, you know, I'm actually transported back in time as to what it was like to walk that property when the lens was turning. And it uh, there's a lot of nostalgia to piece work. Photography, it's been your, your livelihood for a long time, mm -hmm. but it's obviously more than that too. It's a passion for you. Why do you think it became such a passion for you? Well, I, it's just something I really enjoyed from the very start. I picked right up on it. And uh, I come from a family that has a lot of artists, mainly drawlers and painters. And I was never very good at that kind of stuff. So when I picked up the camera, I picked right up on it. I was like, oh, this is this is my medium. I, I'm very good at this. I, I got uh, probably my third year, actually my second year into it, I got a job at a um, a camera store at the mall that had one hour photo. I'm like, all right, well, I can do all my own stuff and learn more from there. And uh, then I got a job at a with a real photography company and I just went from there. And it's, I always wanted to get a job that's something I loved. I didn't want a desk job where I would hate going in every single day. I didn't, I didn't want that. I wanted a job that I would love doing. And even the worst photography jobs I've ever had, I'm like, well, I'm still getting paid to do something I like. And it's, I still learn from it. Some of those 15 hour days photographing sports or, you know, if we're out three in the morning photographing it, you know, it's, you know, below freezing, it's still something I really enjoy. And I get to share from, you know, share my pictures with people after the fact versus, I worked in an office, can't, nobody wants to hear about your office job, but if you can show the pictures from your adventure, or like, hey, check this out. I took pictures in an airplane photographing another airplane. You know, it's, that's my job. It's, it's, it's fun to be able to share that with other people. And I just enjoy doing it. Uh, and the passion comes out in your, your work too. One more question for you for bonus points. Mm -hmm. What do you enjoy most about lighthouse photography? Uh, a lot of the lighthouse photography I've been doing is with other people during the workshops. And I think I really enjoy the camaraderie and the stories that we get to experience with people and hear about with others people. I think I enjoy photographing lighthouses with other people because I get to share it with somebody. It's something I enjoy doing myself, don't get me wrong, but I enjoy doing it with other people. 
And I feel like the lighthouses have brought a lot of people, a lot of us together. Um, I say there's a good six to 10 people that come out on multiple trips a year. And it's always a pleasure to be with them and just talk photography, talk lighthouses. And just it's just very good company. And I feel like the lighthouses have brought people together to do that. Yeah. I agree with that statement. I know on society tours, and you could probably mention this, Jeremy, because you've been on a few. It's that camaraderie that you get in accomplishing these goals of seeing the lighthouses and photographing them. And it's that social aspect that makes these trips, whether they're repeat adventures trips or they're they're one of our more easy trips that uh, make it really appealing. Well, it's a combination of so many things, but the the people and the camaraderie is obviously a really big part of it. It's sharing the adventure. And I think each person kind of pushes the next person to try to get a better picture. So there's a drive from everyone to do your very best. So I want to thank you, Pete Laro. I want to thank you so much for sharing this this time with us. And I just want to mention again, the website, larophotography.com. Mm -hmm. And people absolutely need to, to check that out because uh, just talking about photography is interesting, but it's not the same as looking at the photographs. So appreciate they, that. we need to see your work. And Jeff Gales, also thank you for taking part in this conversation. Makes it extra special. And I'd like to thank Jeff. He's opened up a number of doors for me, and he's, he's been very good to me over the years, and I, I appreciate everything he does. And uh, Jeremy, I've met you a couple of times as well, and I look forward to working with you with some projects in the future and help bring more people into the community. So thank you again, Pete and Jeff, and take care. Thank you. Thank you very much. Regular listeners to this podcast know that we occasionally have Mike Leonard doing segments on photography tips. Mike Leonard and Pete Lero are both amazing photographers of lighthouses and other subjects. Mike Leonard also offers lots of workshops, mostly in Maine, for information, go to his website at phototourismbymike.com. And again, to see Pete Lero's work and to learn about his workshops, go to Lero, that's L-E-R-R-O, lerophotography.com. As always, thanks to all the members, volunteers, and staff of the U.S. Lighthouse Society at Point No Point Light Station in Washington and around the world. Go online to uslhs.org to learn more about everything the Society offers. And remember that donations and memberships in the U.S. Lighthouse Society support this podcast and many other education and preservation projects. A shout out to everyone involved with lighthouse preservation organizations around the country. Keep up your great work. We're all on the same team. And as always, thanks for listening and keep a good light. Everywhere I go, I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine.